Welcome back, Redeemer Fellowship. Welcome to this uh, midweek teaching time. My name is Dave DeHaan. If you were here last time, uh, you were able to get the first installment of this three-part series on learning to read our Bibles uh, better. Really, we're just working through the essential principles of biblical interpretation. Again, the fancy name for that is hermeneutics, but really all it's about is learning to be better uh, Bible readers. Uh, because God intends for his word by his spirit to transform us into the image of Christ. That's really the end game for why we want to be able to read, understand. And if it's our role to, to teach or to preach or to disciple others uh, in any way, shape, or form, uh, we want the Bible to be driving that. And we want to be good readers of the Bible in order to help shape, it, for it to shape others in our discipleship relationships. So last week we got started with two of the eight principles of interpretation that we're going to be talking about. Uh, those two principles were staying on the line, that is staying on the line of Scripture, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Don't say more than what Scripture says, go above the line. Don't say less than what Scripture says. Again, that's a convictional principle. It has to do with our understanding of the truthfulness of God's Word, the inspiration of God's Word, that though the uh, Bible was written by many human authors that ultimately God is what I sometimes call the capital A author of the Bible. Uh, we read uh, in 2 Timothy that his spirit, uh, in the New Testament, that his spirit um, uh, breathed out the word through um, the writing of many authors. And so ultimately it's God's word and we have a, a conviction about that, it's about its truthfulness, about its um, accuracy, and about our need uh, to conform our lives to it. So first convictional principle was staying on the line. Second convictional principle is text and framework. Our frameworks are simply our way of viewing the world. Uh, you might call it worldview. You might call it perspective. And the real question is, when my worldview or framework uh, comes up against something in Scripture that doesn't re, uh, conform to it or agree with it, who is going to win the day? Am I going to stand over God's word and correct it? Or is God's word going to correct me? And will it be the rule in my life? That's text and framework. Three principles today. Those two are, we'll call convictional principles. The next six we're going to call working principles because these are principles that we work out in the text. And I would just say that before we jump into them, uh, this isn't a, an eight-step or a six-step process. Uh, these aren't um, yeah, sort of sequential necessarily, uh, but we're working these principles often at the same time. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a step-by-step -step process. Hey, work principle number one, principle number two. Uh, we're coming at them uh, together in many ways. But let's jump into our first working principle for today. It's called asking good questions. Asking good questions. And with each of these principles, we have a snazzy, illustration, and there it is. This is our illustration for asking good questions. Uh, yeah, real hard to do, right? Two question marks. Now, at some point in life, you were sitting in a class, and there was a very kind teacher in the front of the class, and he or she said to you, you know, students, um, I want you to be inquisitive, and if you have a question, uh, just ask the question because there are no bad questions, and there are no dumb questions. And we all know that that person was lying. There are lots of bad questions. There are lots of dumb questions. Now, I'm going to submit that it's not bad to ask a bad question. It's just bad not to recognize that it was a bad question. We do want to be uh, in sort of interrogators of the text is the way some I've heard it said. We, we do want to be curious. We do want to ask lots of questions of the text that we're studying, whether it's an entire book of the Bible, or whether it's a paragraph in the Bible, or a chapter of the Bible, or a, or a section of a book in, a Bible, in the Bible. Uh, we want to ask lots of questions, but we want to strive to ask good questions. And we want to recognize questions that aren't bad and set them aside and move on uh, to a better question. Really the importance of asking good questions and why we want to strive to ask the best questions of the text is that we want to ask questions that help us to get to the author's intent. And sometimes that may not be obvious. 
And so we have to keep asking questions to drill down into the text. Good questions are ones that lead us down the path that the author wants to take us. Let me say that again. Good questions are going to lead us down the path that the author wants to take us. So let's talk a little bit about asking good questions and the kind of questions we want to ask of the text. Now, again, this isn't, as they say, rocket science. It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, reading the Bible is like reading a lot of literature. You, you want to practice some of the same things. We want to find out what the author intended. And at some point, I think you probably may have heard of sort of uh, journalistic questions, right? So I want to talk about uh, two kinds of questions. Those are sort of the, the, the journalistic questions, right, that we have, the, the, the who. I don't think I've got the who in there. I love the who. Who, what, when, where. If anybody out there recalls the 60s TV show, a mildly entertaining 80s movie starring Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks, Dragnet, uh, Sergeant Friday, just give me the facts, ma'am. Just give me the facts. What are the facts? That, that are the, those are these questions, right? We want to we want to get an understanding of the text and what's going on, particularly if it's it's if it's a narrative, if it's story, what's happening in the story. But then there there are deeper questions. If we want to really dig down and drill down into meaning, we have to ask another set of questions. That dotted line represents sort of uh, the surface, or even think about the, uh, the surface of the earth, right? And you can, you can ask questions to kind of get, to get a, a, an idea of what's going on up here. But if you want to drill down deeper, you've got to ask uh, these deeper questions. These questions that, that have to do not just with content, but they get into intent. What was the author really getting at? Um, I'm a fan of the TV show, um, The Curse of Oak Island, and The Curse of Oak Island is about digging. Now, the Lagina brothers and their partners, they start out by uh, understanding the topography of Oak Island and figuring a lot of stuff out and looking at maps and observing the surface. But if they really wanna find out if there is a treasure buried somewhere below Oak Island. And if it has uh, anything to do with the Knights Templar or anything else, the only way they're going to find out is if they get below the surface, if they get down there. And that's what we want to do when we're studying God's Word and being good readers of it. We want to initially ask those questions of content, who, what, when, uh, and get down into the questions of intent, why and how. Now, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles and turn to the book of Jonah. And let's practice this a little bit in the first chapter of Jonah. And I'm going to I'm going to trust that you've read this before. And just take a look at the again at the first chapter of Jonah. What would be um, initially some questions of, of content? Just trying to get the facts. What's going on? Well, I think a good question would be, who exactly is Jonah? And, and what, what, do we, what does the text say about who is Jonah? And, and where is Tarshish? Uh, Jonah is told to go to Nineveh. We might, we might want to know, well, where is Nineveh and where is Tarshish in relationship to Nineveh? And uh, you know, other things that we could ask, where is, where is Joppa? And... Um, just, just the details of what's going on. Those are the sort of give me the facts, right? What is the significance of, of, of some of Jonah's words? But then we want to go beyond that. We want to make sure, okay, I, I understand the story. Jonah received the word of God, but he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. And so he gets a ship going to Tarshish. And I find out that Tarshish is a really long ways away from Nineveh. And, and I start asking deeper questions. 
Why did he choose Tarshish as his destination? Why does the author say in verse 3 that Jonah went down to Joppa? And then he went down into the ship. And then again, in verse 5, he had gone down. And if we keep picking that up into chapter 2 of Jonah, we see that when once he's uh, is tossed into the sea, he keeps going down and down and down. Perhaps the author is saying something about Jonah more than just his physical presence and where he is spatially, but there's something else about Jonah going down. Another question, why, if the mariners, if the sailors on the, on the ship here who are all pagans are calling out to their God, why isn't Jonah calling out to his? Again, we want to ask questions that get at the meaning of the text. Here's a question I think that if you study the book of Jonah will help you to get to the meaning of the text. In what sense does Jonah think that he fears the Lord? He says, when they ask him who he is, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews in verse 9. I fear the Lord God who made the heavens and the earth. He says he fears. The sailors become exceedingly afraid. And then later, uh, at the end of, the, of this first chapter, or near the end of it in verse 16, it says that these pagan sailors feared the Lord or, or feared Yahweh exceedingly. They feared them. What is the author telling us uh, by saying that Jonah said he feared, but by the end of this part of the story, these pagan sailors are now fearing? Why, for instance, do the sailors call out to the Lord God in verse 14? And they actually use his covenant name. In my uh, translation, it's capitalized, so I know that even though it says Lord, the word behind that is, is God's covenant name, Yahweh. And they call out to Yahweh, these pagan sailors. And, and they, they ask that they, would not be, that they would not perish. And they sort of ask forgiveness in advance for tossing Jonah into the sea. And they even recognize God's sovereignty. Hmm. I wonder if the author is meaning for there to be irony here that, that Jonah doesn't recognize God's authority and his sovereignty in his life, but these pagan sailors do. And I have to keep coming back to the end of this little section in Jonah, at uh, verse 16, where it says that, again, the sailors feared Yahweh exceedingly, and they offered sacrifices, that's worship, to Yahweh, and they made vows. Is the author saying that, these sailors came to some kind of faith, even a saving faith in the Lord God? Asking good questions. We're asking good questions in order to get to the meaning of the text. Now, the end game, I haven't gotten to this principle yet, but the end game is to get to the main idea and the transformational intent of the text. We're going to talk about that next time. You can see already we're uh, we, we're never purely in one of these uh, biblical interpretive principles. We're, we're working them at the same time uh, in most cases. But good questions are going to get us to the author's intent. Now, I want to keep moving along, and so I'm going to take us to the, the next principle, and it is a principle called genre. And with, with all the principles, we've got another illustration. It's going to take me one second to put it up there. So genre. By the way, genre is not something that applies only to scripture. You can think about different genre of, of music. You can different, think of different genres of, of movies. Okay, I'm glad you're not here for me to ask you to guess what that is. Uh, if I did, what I hoped you would say is, if I asked you what all those things have in common, is that they're fruit, right? Uh, but they're different. 
So the, the point with genre is that there are different types of biblical literature. Not everything in the Bible is a story. Not everything in the Bible is poetry. Not everything in the Bible is law. These are different types of styles of writing, different types of literature. And the point with the illustration is these are different types of fruit. Now, the end game with fruit is always the same. You want to you get to the fruit. You want to get to the good part. You want to eat that. Uh, but the way you do that is very different. With an apple, you just pick it up, you chunk into it. You can, you can immediately get to the fruit and the goodness of it. Uh, with a banana, you don't, that I'm aware of, you don't pick up a banana and just bite into it. So you have to peel it first. So it takes a little bit of effort uh, to get into a banana. Uh, and you definitely don't do that with a pineapple. You don't just bite into a pineapple, you'll end up at the hospital. Uh, but you have to slice it and you have to take the core out and all of that. They're all fruit. The end game's the same with all of them. You want to get to the good stuff, you want to get the fruit inside and uh, taste that deliciousness. Uh, but the way you approach it will be different depending on the different kind of fruit. And so, the same way in the Bible, different types of writing in the Bible, different types of literature, uh, we can't approach them all exactly the same way. The end game is the same. We want to understand the author's intent. What is the main idea and transformational intent of a particular text that we're looking at? But we're going to approach that differently. If you think about perhaps... Um, the different types of literature, the different genre in scripture, you might think about a spectrum. And on this end of the spectrum, you have types of writing that's, um, that's much more concrete, written in, in, in realistic, a little bit more straightforward terms. Uh, propositional truth uh, might be one way to say it. Typically, this is more wordy. On it, this end, you have uh, types of literature that emphasize more the, the, the metaphoric or use more images or have more emotive language and sometimes uh, more condensed language. So less words, pictures, so forth, more straightforward over here. Think about the different types of literature in the Bible. On that spectrum, for instance, uh, where would you put poetry? Well, you put it over here. Lots of images, lots of emotive words. Uh, on the other hand, where would you put Paul's letters or the other epistles in the New Testament? That's, that's much more straightforward, much more concrete, much more propositional truth. Where would you put something like prophecy? Mm, maybe a little bit more toward the, the pictures and images. There's lots of those, but it also includes some more straightforward language as well. Um, gospels. Well, gospels are stories, but they also include things like uh, parables um, and sayings. And so they're probably more toward the propositional truth, but maybe not as far as perhaps law. Now, what do we have when we're getting into the book of Jonah? Jonah is very interesting in terms of genre. Um, where it fits in the Bible and the type of book that it says, and even the category that we have it in, is that of prophetic literature. It's a prophecy. It's a prophetic book, I should say. But it doesn't have a lot of prophecy-type language. It's, it's not like Jeremiah or um, Isaiah, for instance, or really most of the other prophets in that way. It's mostly written as historical narrative. It's, it's mainly in story form though I think there are reasons why it's in the prophets, uh, because the, the distinctives of, of prophecy are such that God is um, reaching out to his people through a prophet to let them know that they've, they've broken his, his covenant, and he's, calling, he's laying out the blessings and cursings in front of them, and he's calling them back to himself. And I think there's a sense in which that is definitely happening in the book of Jonah, even though it's not happening with uh, prophecies are in such a prophetic way, but it's, it's, it's mainly narrative. But if you look again at the text of Jonah, you notice that chapter two is, is different. It even looks different in our English Bibles. It's, it's edited in, in verse, and it is actually a, a poetry or, or a prayer. It, it belongs in the whole area of poetic literature. So again, Jonah is very interesting. Fits in the prophets. Its genre is mainly historical narrative, but it does have about a fourth of it that is poetic. And by the way, when you're reading 
scripture. If you're reading one book of scripture and you see a shift or a change in genre, that that's really a time to sort of, you know, the red flags go up and, and you know, the, the antenna go up. It's like, okay, what is the author doing here? Why did he choose to change, to do a genre switch on us right here? How is he saying it? And what does he want to say to us? All right. I want to keep going here and get to our third, our third principle for tonight, fifth principle overall. So we're, we're going to have to be, learn how to be good readers of the text in terms of understanding that um, we've got uh, historical narrative in front of us. And I'm going to come back to that as I talk about this next principle. And our next principle is that of structure. And hey, guess what? Structure has a cool, at least I think it's cool, illustration that goes with it. And it gets, it's getting a little bit more complex with these illustrations. So hang with me while I put up the illustration for structure. Okay, again, I'm glad you're not here for me to ask what you think that is and to be embarrassed that uh, you can't recognize that that is a bridge. It looks a little bit like a bridge, doesn't it? It's a bridge. And the idea with structure, the reason that this illustrates structure, again, we wanna find the structure of a passage, a book of the Bible, a chapter of the Bible, a portion of scripture that we're working on. Uh, here's how this illustrates structure. In every passage, there are major ideas or major themes, uh, but they just don't sit by themselves. They are connected to one another. So the author gives us major big ideas and he connects them to one another. And the idea of finding the structure of the passage, the structure of the passage and how those um, major ideas are connected is gonna help us to understand, uh, again, the author's intent or the big idea or the main idea of the passage. So the structure of the passage, the author has written in such a way as to carry his main idea. These again, these major ideas, think of those as units of thought. So if you're looking at a passage, you're looking at a whole book of the Bible, you're looking at a chapter of the Bible, see if you can break it down in its component parts and think about component parts in the sense of units of thought. But again, those units of thoughts aren't just hanging there by themselves, they are connected to one another. And how they are connected is how the author is making his argument and giving us the main idea. Now, as we're thinking about the way that uh, historical narrative is put together, that's what Jonah is, that's our sort of test case that we're applying these principles to. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a narrative, it's story. And I want you to, to look at your text in front of you and see if you can roughly, how would you, how would you find the units of thought in the book of Jonah based on scene change? Think about that. We're in, we're in narrative. Narrative is a story. And you might think of it like going to a play or watching a movie. Different scene changes. In the play, the, the curtain falls and then it goes up and it's a new scene. And, and often the background has been changed as well. Where does the background change in Jonah? Take a look at the text. We, we begin with Jonah. We don't know exactly where he is. He's called to uh, go to Nineveh. He doesn't want to go there. He boards a ship for Tarshish. And so Chapter one from verse one, and I would say all the way to verse 16, they're, they're in the ship. Either he's getting on the ship or they're in the ship. And we don't really have a scene change until verse 17. In verse 17, where's Jonah now? He's no longer on the ship. He's, as my dad would say, he's in the drink. He's been tossed in the water. Uh, he asked for it. He got it. This is Jonah's death wish. And so far as these sailors know, they've, they've given it to him. But God sovereignly, notice he appoints a great fish to swallow Jonah. Now, now here's another little interesting 
um, I shouldn't say interesting, just helpful way of finding the structure of a book or the structure of a passage. Notice that verse 17 begins, the Lord appointed a great fish. And then chapter 2, verse 10 says, the Lord spoke to the fish. You see those as almost bookends. You have, you have God sovereignly ordaining the fish. You have God speaking to the fish. Uh, when I see that, I see one unit of thought. And so even though the editors of the Bible, whenever they did that, I don't know if it was like 500 years ago or whatever it was, even though they chose to put the chapter break at 2 verse 1, um, those chapter breaks aren't inspired and they don't have to rule the day in terms of how you divide up the passage. In fact, I would encourage you as, as much as possible and as helpful as they are uh, to, in a sense, ignore them and just see, especially in narrative, if you can just read the text and, and find out where the natural breaks are. Well, I think there's a natural break in verse 17. We go from the ship into the sea. Jonah's in the sea. And even his prayer in chapter 2 uh, recalls him going to the bottom of the sea and, and the fish swallowing him. And then he's spit out of the sea uh, by the end of chapter 2. And then in 3.1, we have a scene change. And Jonah is somewhere on dry land near Nineveh, and he's near Nineveh, he's in Nineveh in all of chapter 3, and then I would say in 4, chapter 1, we have another scene change, because now Jonah is, now he's outside the city. He was in the city, he was preaching a, a message of sorts, basically a turn or burn message, or, or really just the burn part, he didn't even seem to tell them to turn. He just said 40 days and Nineveh's going down. He just got the burn part of that down. And that's what's going on. And the people miraculously repent, despite the limited information that the abbreviated message, you don't even hear about God's grace in the message that Jonah speaks. And that goes on to the end of chapter three. And then all of chapter four is outside the city. It's Jonah pouting. It's Jonah's arguing with God. It's uh, Jonah's next, his second death wish in this whole deal. We're saying, God, just blot me out. I can't even, I can't handle the truth. Uh, these Ninevites repenting, I can't handle it. I'm going to go sit outside the city and, and, and hope against hope that maybe you will destroy them in the end. And so you have four distinct scenes. Uh, first in the ship, then Jonah in the fish, then, then inside Nineveh for the most part, and then outside Nineveh. Now, I want you, what I want you to observe real quickly is that is who are the main characters? Again, we're thinking about we're in historical narrative. Uh, we have scenes. We have settings. We have characters when we're in narrative. Who are the characters? Well, chapter one, you've got the Lord or Yahweh. You've got Jonah. You've got the mariners. You've got the captain of the ship. Scene two in the fish, you've got the Lord. You've got Jonah. You've got a great fish. Chapter 3, uh, in the city of Nineveh, you have the Lord, you have Jonah, you have the Ninevites, you have the king, and you've got cattle. Uh, and in verse 4, we're outside the city, we've got the Lord, we've got Jonah, we've got a worm and a plant and people, and I believe more cattle. What did you notice about the characters? Which characters were consistent in all four scenes of the story? Well, it was the Lord and Jonah. So we've looked at the structure, we've, we've broken it down into its component, pe component pieces. We've, we've, we've wrestled with it in terms of it, uh, the components of, or the, the aspects of narrative. And we've identified that in all four scenes, there are two characters that are consistent. It is the Lord and it is Jonah. Now, if you ask a lot of people what the book of Jonah is about, they might say Jonah but they'll probably say a big fish, perhaps a whale. Um, clearly the book is not about a big fish. And it's not about a big fish in Jonah. It's about the Lord in Jonah. So getting at the meaning of this text is going to have to do with, with understanding the relationship between the Lord, between Yahweh and Jonah, and what's going on in their interaction with one another. That's, genre, that's structure. And notice again, genre dictates structure. 
the type of literature that um, that the author has chosen to use to communicate his message is going to dictate the structure. But as we follow that, we begin to get closer to the meaning of the text. And already, uh, we're understanding that um, the message of Jonah, the message of Jonah has something to do with the Lord and with Yahweh. I'm sorry, with, with Yahweh, who is the Lord and with Jonah. The message of, of the book of Jonah has to do with the Lord and with Jonah. There are other characters um, there are wonderful things that happen to the other characters, whether it's the sailors calling out to the Lord, whether it's repentance of the Ninevites. Uh, those, those are all, we observe those. But what we're left is that the message of Jonah seems to be driving about what's happening between Jonah. Jonah is sometimes, I've, I've heard Jonah referred to as the reluctant prophet. Folks, that is the hugest understatement ever. Jonah wasn't reluctant. He just flat out didn't want to do it. Uh, the Lord told him to go to these Ninevites. And we start to get the understanding of his viewpoint of the Ninevites. He says, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. But he doesn't seem to care about the sailors on the, on the ship who he is causing them to go down. He's just going to be in the bottom of that ship and, and sleep it off. Or maybe he'll just go ahead and die by himself. It's only after this, the captain has him come to the, the top of the ship that he even gets involved. He doesn't care about that. He doesn't care that much about the Ninevites. He gives them a very, I think, a very limited message. Could he have said more? I, the text doesn't, says, doesn't say he, I want to stay on the line. The text doesn't say that he said anything more uh, to the Ninevites except 40 days and, and, Ninevite, and Nineveh is going down. And yet they repent. And Jonah's not happy about it. And so then you get this whole interaction in chapter 4 between the Lord and, the Nineveh, and, and Jonah, saying, do you have a right? Do you have a right to be, to be upset and angry? And Jonah's saying, yes, I have a right. What right? You didn't make these people. I made these people, the Lord seems to be saying. So next time around, we're going we're gonna to take that and we're going to drill down a little bit deeper as we work through three more principles of biblical interpretation. So, by way of review, last time we talked about two convictional principles called staying on the line of Scripture and text and framework, submitting our frameworks to, the, to God's text of Scripture. Uh, today we've talked about asking good questions of the text that help us to get to the author's uh, meaning and intent. We've talked about uh, the type of literature. This is our fourth principle or genre and understanding how truth is communicated differently through different types of literature. And then we've looked at the structure, which is connected to genre. Uh, the way a passage is broken down into its component parts is going to be very much dependent on the type of literature or the genre. Well, friends, keep in mind that uh, our goal is to understand what the author is saying. We talk about the small a author, the author, the human author that God inspired uh, to write the Bible, but ultimately what that person wrote is what the capital A author, what God himself wanted us to hear through his spirit. And we're trying to drive toward what is the main idea and then therefore what is the transformational intent of a particular passage of scripture. So for next time, keep reading Jonah. That's what good Bible readers do. They read over and over again. Try to understand the story. Try to pick up on the details and get that, that thrust. So keep on reading Jonah. Hey, if you have time, uh, here are some passages we're going to refer to next time around. 2 Kings 14, 23 to 27. 2 Kings 14, 23 to 27. 1 Kings 11, 41 through chapter 12. 33, 1 Kings 11, verse 41 through chapter 12, 33. Then Exodus 34, verses 4 to 8. And you could even begin at chapter 32 to see what ramps up. Just observe that. Exodus 34, 4 through 8. And then Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Hey, thanks again for joining us uh, for this midweek Bible teaching time, Redeemer fellowship. Let me just pray and ask God's blessing on the reading and the studying and the understanding of his word. Heavenly Father, we 
uh, bow our heads before you uh, and before your word. It is the exact uh, revelation that you wanted it to be. It, it tells us who you are, tells us who we are uh, in, uh, before your face. And it, it, more than anything else, shows us Jesus. And Lord, we pray that we would be um, just become better students of your word, that we would find great joy in reading it and studying it and understanding it. And as we do that, and as we respond to what your spirit is teaching us, we pray that you would change us and transform us more and more into the image of the Lord Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks again. See you next time.